Hello, welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist, Ben Gallagher. This one follows straight on from the asexual reproduction video and now contrasts that by looking at sexual reproduction, which is where you've got two parents involved instead of just one parent that was involved in asexual reproduction. It's from the GCSE specification and please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you. So as we've already mentioned and looked at in the last video, there's two forms of reproduction, sexual and asexual. You should have already watched the asexual reproduction video, which is basically natural cloning only involving one parent. We're focusing now on the mechanism behind sexual reproduction, which involves two organisms. Please keep in mind, we're looking here at the mechanisms. This isn't a sex education video. So we're not actually looking at sex. We're looking at sexual reproduction as a mechanism by which two organisms can create one new one that's a blending of those two original ones. So you need two parents, you need a male and a female because they're both gonna contribute gametes, the sperm and the egg, and that gametes were produced by meiosis, and you really must have watched the meiosis video ahead of this one, and that gametes contain 50% of each of the parents' DNA. Now, by whatever mechanism, and the mechanisms vary wildly between different creatures, Fertilization needs to take place. The sperm and the ovum need to be linked together. Obviously in humans, that's where the sperm are released at the cervix, at the back of the vagina, so they can swim through the cervix, through the uterus, down the fallopian tube to fertilize the egg. But that's just in humans. There's loads of other mechanisms by which fertilization takes place. We'll look at some of those briefly on another slide. But the nuclei need to fuse together and that will give you a zygote. The zygote is the very first cell that contains 100% of the DNA. So you at one point were just a zygote, one cell, the only cell that's ever existed that was uniquely you. That cell, of course, that zygote now needs to multiply by mitosis, and mitosis will form a little cluster of cells, which is an embryo. At that stage, they're undifferentiated. Go back and watch the video on cell differentiation and stem cells if you don't know what I'm talking about there. That's way back in the cell biology playlist, the first playlist of the course. After a couple of days though, those cells are going to start to specialize, start to differentiate, pick which bits of DNA are useful to them, and they'll form a more organized embryo. That more organized embryo will start to form into a fetus. The woman, of course, is pregnant, and the baby's growing inside her in the uterus and after nine months in humans she's going to give birth to a fully formed fully differentiated baby that's a new member of that same species okay now we've got a mixing here of the two parents this mechanism though is true for basically all sexual reproduction on the planet two organisms producing gametes the gametes fuse together in fertilization which grow into an embryo, which grow into an offspring. Those are the basic components here. If we just take this though and turn it into plants, you may wanna take a quick screenshot of this just so you've got the basic mechanism for humans. Okay, let's now go on to look at plants. So if I, um, if I replaced both parents up there with plants, now I've got it down as father and mother up there, but actually, Flowers have both male and female parts. They have the male parts that are going to release um, the pollen, the anthers and the filaments. You've got the, car the carpal then that's going to produce the, the, the holds the ovule in the ovaries in the female part. Now, um, both of those are still going to produce gametes. In the female part, it's now called an ovule, not an ovum. In the male part, it doesn't produce sperm. As I've just said, it produces pollen. So I'm putting a pollen grain over there now, okay? Pollen grains, though, still like any gametes, contain a nucleus that is haploid, that contains half of the genetic information from that plant. Fertilization now, though, isn't by what we think of sex. Pollen can be carried by bees, it can be blown around in the wind, but by some mechanism, the pollen is gonna land on the flower of another plant, move down, fertilize the egg. Okay, so you've still got fertilization. It's still gonna form a zygote. It's still gonna form an embryo and differentiate into a more complex embryo. But of course, it's not a woman that's pregnant now. Inside the flower, it forms a seed. So the seed is kind of like the whole uterus of a woman because inside that growing seed is the embryo. But of course, the embryo doesn't grow into a baby like we've got here. You plant the seed, the embryo is going to burst out of the seed as it grows and turn into a new baby plant. But that plant is a mixture of the two parent plants still. 
So you can see I've hardly had to change the diagram at all, and I haven't changed the writing at all. And we've switched it from human to plant. Very different things, but the mechanism is the same. And that's what's important on this video, that you understand the mechanism behind all sexual reproduction. OK, so let's now look at different forms of sexual reproduction in different organisms. And there's only really two main questions that we need to look at. The first one of these is whether an organism shows internal or external fertilization. Now, if it's internal fertilization, that's things like sexual intercourse, like we as humans do. But the sperm are released inside the female. So they're, they're safe, they're protected, they're hopefully not, not going to get lost. Um, and hopefully one of those will get to the egg, fertilize it, and it grows inside the woman. But there's lots of other examples. An external fertilization, pollination kind of an example of this, because the pollen's released just externally into the air or into a bee or whatever, goes to the flower of another organism and fertilizes it there. But a better example of external fertilization is in fish spawning. So at a certain specific point, all the males and females come together and in one, like literally in a split second, they all swim up together and they release their sperm, release their eggs into the water and make a cloud of sperm and eggs, which you can see on this picture. Now, hopefully the sperm and eggs will float to each other, fertilize each other, create zygotes that can grow into new babies. But of course, it's external to the body. So those fertilized eggs, those zygotes are now just going to float down to the seabed where hopefully they won't be eaten by loads of other things. They won't be blown and washed away or whatever, and they'll just grow into new organisms. That might seem really inefficient, but actually you only need a very tiny percentage of the eggs to survive and hatch into new fish to replace the numbers of the populations that were already there. Let's look at the second question now, which is whether it's internal or external embryo growth. So we as humans show internal embryo growth. The baby grows inside the woman, inside the uterus, and we give birth to live young. That's true for quite a few species on the planet. But actually, historically, throughout the evolution, the most common has been by eggs. Now, here's an ostrich egg. You may instantly have thought like chicken eggs, but let's just go ostrich egg because it's huge. But remember, it's one cell. Same as the, the, the zygote, same as the eggs in humans. It was one cell originally. Now, fertilization with ostriches and chickens and all birds happens internally. So the male and female um, ostrich have sex, the sperm are released internally, fertilization happens internally, but the egg then gets covered in the shell. The female lays the egg. She looks after it, unlike the fish that we've seen up there, um, and it will hatch and you'll get a baby that way. But the growth of the embryo was inside the egg, not inside the mother. Okay. Another form of egg over here, frog spawn. You probably had these in school when you were little, you may have kept them at home, um, but frog spawn are still just eggs. Each one is an individual egg. Now there was a massive evolutionary leap forward that happened here because fish that we've got up there, frog spawn, amphibians, they laid eggs that were just like jelly. What happened when those evolved into reptiles is they covered their eggs in a waterproof that be laid out of water because they can't dry out now that they've got this shell. That allowed animals to move further inland away from competition towards new food resources. So just having eggs with a covering allowed expansion of animals over the whole planet. So that's a massive leap forward in evolution, like these reptile eggs next to me. Just as a final example of eggs I'll give you here, these are shark eggs. Now, not all sharks lay eggs, only a few do. Um, some sharks have normal sexual reproduction like we do and internal fertilization. Some sharks give birth to live young, but some sharks lay eggs like these. And the sharks grow inside those eggs and hatch out away from the mother. So I've just given you that example to show you that there's loads and loads of species that lay eggs and have external embryo growth, but in very, very different ways. And of course, it's not just eggs that can be external embryo growth. Seeds, we talked about seeds briefly on the last slide, but seeds are where the plant, so there's, there's the parent plant, makes the seeds, but the seeds then just fall off, carried away in the wind, carried away by water, carried away by insects, whatever. Those seeds have the embryo inside them. If you're eating seeds, there is a tiny plant embryo inside that seed alongside all its food store and all its nutrients.
So we've got internal or external fertilization and internal or external embryo growth. But of course, there's some creatures that are a bit weird and kind of do the best of both worlds. Here's a kangaroo. Now, you probably all know from when you were little that kangaroos carry their babies in pouches. But the baby kangaroo is actually born as the little sort of weird little pink inlaid creature that you can see. You can see its eye. You can see its tiny little arms on the side there. That's what the kangaroo actually gives birth to. So the female kangaroo gets pregnant, internal fertilization. Then at a very early stage in its development, she gives birth to that tiny, tiny, literally that big, a few centimeters long, tiny, tiny baby kangaroo. It comes out of the vagina, out of the birth canal, on its own, climbs up the fur on the front of her body, underneath, like on the front of the pouch, finds its way to the pouch opening, crawls inside and attaches to a nipple inside the pouch where it then does the rest of its growth, feeding on the milk from the mother. It can then stay in the pouch for months and months and it will quite often get back in the pouch when it's a bit tired. The kangaroo, the, the juvenile here shown in the pouch here, is quite an old one to still be going back and forth into its pouch. But that's really weird. So it's sort of grow the embryo a bit until it's just about able to cope for itself, then put it out of the body, crawls up and gets back inside the body. But the pouch is kind of only on the outside like a pocket. It's, it's, it's a weird mechanism, but that's why I'm giving it to you because all organisms have evolved such a wide range of really weird reproductive methods. Let's just get rid of that now and let's move on to the next slide. OK, the last thing we're going to talk about is life cycles. So we've already illustrated there's loads of weird ways in which creatures are found to make babies. But let's look at some of the weirder life cycles as well. So most organisms go through distinct and recognisable stages in their life. This includes humans. You can just look at a human and roughly gauge their age because babies are very distinct. We know what they look like. But then babies turn into toddlers. You could look at a toddler and you would know, well, that's a toddler, not a baby, because it's moving around. Its proportions of its body are different. And when a toddler grows into a child, sort of much more active when it's, you know, five, six, seven, whatever. Very, very obvious difference. Now, one of the big differences there is in the ratio of the head to the body. Babies have big heads relative to their body. Your head doesn't actually grow very much as you grow up certainly not as much as the rest of the body because the brain needs to develop a huge amount and a lot of that happens um, early on. A child would turn into a teenager, a teenager goes through some of the most important shifts in terms of our reproductive cycle in that we go through puberty as a teenager. Now puberty exists to turn the teenager, the child, into an adult for the reason of getting them into their reproductive form. It is a kind of metamorphosis. There's a massive difference. Physiologically, you could just look and go, well, that's a child, that's an adult. The musculature is different. The skeleton is different. Literally, bones start to grow and big, get bigger and thicken at a very rapid rate at puberty. Organs start to come into action that weren't in action before. We undergo this huge metamorphosis at puberty to turn from a child to an adult, because as an adult, we're in our reproductive form where we can make the new generation. If we didn't have that metamorphosis stage at puberty, we wouldn't reach a reproductive form, we wouldn't be able to make another generation and humans would go extinct. So we have these very distinct stages of our development. But there's some creatures that have it far more obvious than others. If I show you here, this is an egg of a monarch butterfly. And the egg hatches into a caterpillar. The caterpillar will form itself into a chrysalis once it's big enough. And of course, from the chrysalis emerges a butterfly. Now, those are vastly different. If you didn't know, if you were really little before you got told about caterpillars and butterflies, there's no way if I held up a butterfly and a caterpillar and said, look, same creature. You go, no, not a chance. They don't look anything alike. But it's because they go through this very dramatic metamorphosis. And actually, inside the chrysalis, it's not just that the caterpillar grows wings, which is what lots of people think, and that that middle bit of the butterfly there, the kind of body bit, is the caterpillar and it just grows wings. The caterpillar basically disintegrates at a cellular level 
breaks apart all its cells, turns into almost like a, a mush of cells and totally reorganizes all its cells. The metamorphosis there is enormous, much more obvious than we have at puberty. There's all other organisms that show very obvious ones. We looked at frog spawn on a previous slide. Uh, going from a tadpole through to a froglet through to a frog is obviously very significant metamorphosis changes. But some creatures have even weirder life cycles combining asexual and sexual reproduction. If I put this little thing there, I very much doubt anyone, any one of you looking at this would recognise what that is. But that is the plasmodium protoctist or protista that causes malaria. Now, I would hope you've all heard of malaria. Terrible, terrible disease, kills so many people on the planet. It's one of the biggest killers that's ever existed on planet Earth. But the plasmodium protoctist actually has two different life cycles and two forms of reproduction. Now you should know that malaria is generally spread by mosquitoes. The mosquitoes will bite an individual, uh, and if that individual's already got the plasmodium protoctist in their blood, then when the mosquito bites them and sucks their blood, they'll also suck up some of that protoctist, that plasmodium. Okay, plasmodium is the name of the protoctist. Okay, now when the protoctist is inside the mosquito, it does sexual reproduction. It divides by meiosis, forms gametes. The gametes can cross fertilize with other plasmodium gametes that might be in there, and it does sexual reproduction, potentially increasing its variation. Now, when the mosquito then bites another human, and when it bites them and it injects some of its saliva to help it to, to suck the blood out, it injects some of the plasmodium back into the human. Now, when that plasmodium goes into the human, it goes to the human liver cells, infects those and replicates by mitosis now. So asexually increase its numbers in the liver cells, destroys liver cells, gets out into the blood, infects blood cells, reproduces by mitosis in the blood cells, destroys the blood cells. And malaria kills you because it destroys so much of your liver and your blood that they lose their, their functions, they lose their abilities. But that's asexual reproduction when it's in the humans. And then it can be eaten by another mosquito and goes back to its sexual phase. So what a weird, multi-stepped, multi possibility life cycle. Same with fungi. Fungi can be sexually reproducing or asexual. They can produce spores that are haploid. The spores can spread and fertilize other spores or they can remain diploid and reproduce by mitosis. There's loads of organisms that can do both forms of life cycle. But remember, sexual reproduction is a very weird and varied form of multiplying, but it guarantees variation, and that's what's important. Okay, so just like at the end of the asexual reproduction, I'm gonna give you the key points here, because you don't need to know any specific examples of the things I've run through. You just need to know the overall mechanism. So let's look at the key points. Sexual reproduction requires two parent organisms. It requires meiosis to form gametes. And remember, they contain 50% of the parent organism's DNA. Two gametes need to fuse together to form a zygote, and that's the first one with the full set of DNA, that's diploid. Fertilization, when the nuclei of the gamete, gametes fuse, that can be internal or external, and embryo growth can be internal or external. And life cycles of different organisms are highly varied, because there's loads of different ways that it can be successful to create a new organism. But the key thing is that the offspring will show variation from the parents, and that's a huge advantage when it comes to evolution. It allows you to be better prepared for any shifts and changes in your environment in the selective pressures. The bigger the variation, the more the likelihood that some of your species will be a variant that can survive under change. Now, remember, many organisms use both forms of reproduction. They can have an asexually reproducing stage and a sexually reproducing stage. But that's it. This slide basically contains all the key information. The first slide with the mother and father and the gametes forming the embryo, forming the baby, that's also a really important one. But there's not a huge amount to actually learn from these presentations. OK, so the last three presentations, the meiosis one, the asexual and sexual reproduction videos are all kind of background in setting you up for this really, really important topic of genetic inheritance, how the genes are passed from one parent, uh, both parents to the offspring and how they're reorganized and why some get read and why some don't. So this is a really important video to head to next. As always, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Like this video if you found it useful and head over to my Facebook page for some extra supplementary information.
Thank you.